Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to another episode of What's Up Doc. I'm your host, Dr. Ali El Barwani, and I'm a board certified physician. My show, What's Up Doc, is a production of Muslim Network TV, the only Muslim focused network broadcasting in North America. You can watch all of our shows streaming on Roku TV, Fire TV, Apple TV, and Galaxy 19. You can also find us on our website at muslimnetwork.tv and on our YouTube page at, mus- at youtube.com forward slash Muslim Network TV. Today, we've got another skin edition topic, and we're going to be talking about eczema, a condition that affects up to 31.6 million Americans, or up to 10% of the population. Joining us in that discussion, is Dr. Gloria Nguyen. Dr. Nguyen was born and raised in the Bay Area and attended college at nearby Stanford University where she studied human biology. She later went on to New York to receive her medical degree from Albert Einstein College of Medicine in 2011. She then completed a year-long skin cancer research fellowship at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, before going on to complete her dermatology residency training at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Dr. Nguyen currently practices in the Bay Area. Welcome back. And she's also not a stranger. Welcome back, Dr. Nguyen. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you so much for having me back today. Absolutely. Well, I had such a good time at our last discussion that we just had to have you back and talk some more about the skin. I'm sure you're very excited. It's all you do. (laughs) I live, breathe, and eat for (laughs) skin. Well, today we're going to be talking about something that I see a lot for sure in primary care, and I'm sure as a dermatologist, you've diagnosed quite a bit, and that's eczema or atopic dermatitis. Now, I know that it can be used interchangeably, and sometimes that term eczema can be used to mean something completely different, a bigger umbrella term. So let's start by defining what it is and how how we're going to be talking about it in our episode today. Sure. So um, you're totally correct that a lot of people use eczema and atopic dermatitis kind of interchangeably. Um, What it describes is a condition where people are prone to dry, itchy red skin. Um, When it occurs during childhood, um, that's often referred to as atopic dermatitis. Um, And for some people, you know, it can improve as they get older, but for most people, um, it can continue to be an issue that they have to um, deal with as an adult as well. So what exactly is happening in this condition? What do patients who have eczema or atopic dermatitis experience typically or in the most classic picture? So people usually will come in complaining of um, dry, uh, red, itchy, um, or flaky, scaly skin on different parts of their body. And in different age groups, it can affect different parts of the body. So for babies and young children, um, it most often affects the face and the inside of the elbow or behind the knee. Um, In adults, it often affects um, the face, the neck, the hands, the legs. But technically, you can get eczema anywhere on the skin or the body. Interesting. So that brings up me to the question of whether eczema can be present, present, excuse me, on the scalp, because sometimes it can be difficult to um, d- define atopic dermatitis versus something else like seborrheic keratosis, etc. So w- when you say everywhere in the body, could somebody also have that on their scalp? If they have very severe eczema on the body, then it can certainly affect the scalp as well. Um, however, the scalp is a little bit of a specific location with unique characteristics because it is a hair bearing area um, that produces a lot of oil. Um, so more commonly when people complain of itchy, dry, flaky scalp, that's more commonly due to dandruff or what we call seborrheic dermatitis. And that's treated a little bit differently than eczema. Most people who have eczema will usually have it on their body um, and they may also have it on the scalp but it would be unusual for somebody to have eczema only on the scalp without also having it on other places in your body. Okay, all right. So thanks for clearing that up. Now that we know how it presents or what are some of the typical symptoms somebody can show or find, tell us what causes this. Where does this come from? Is it relate, what is it related to? 
So we really believe that eczema is caused by a combination of both genetic factors and environmental factors. So um, it can often run in families and there is a genetic component of it. If your mother or father had eczema, um, they are more likely to have children who will also be affected by eczema. And then um, at the same time, there's um, environmental factors as well. So if you can think of your skin, um, this in this analogy, um, if you think of your skin as a brick wall, um, people who have um, eczema, you know, the mortar is missing from this brick wall. So as a result, you have this kind of leaky barrier and water escapes out of the skin very easily. People with eczema have a hard time with um, retaining moisture and water in their skin and they get very dry skin. And then things in the environment, um, chemicals, compounds, um, things that can irritate the skin easily get into the skin and can cause local inflammation. Um, so it's a, it's a combination of uh, both things, genetic and environmental. When, it, when you talk about environmental factors, that brings me to flare-ups for people who have um, eczema. So a lot of the times I'm noticing, as you mentioned, there's this leaky barrier, and so moisture does come is drawn out of the skin. And I tend to notice that happens in the wintertime. For a majority of us, we tend to have drier skin, and so patients with eczema tend to have flare-ups of their eczema during the drier seasons. Do you see this as well? We definitely do see worse eczema in the winter months because the air is just so dry and so cold. And that really draws, you know, makes the skin much more dry. And as a result, eczema can flare. Um, however, you know, it's different for everyone. Some people actually think that their eczema is worse in the summertime because they're hot and sweating. And the heat and sweat may also irritate the skin as well. Um, if you live in a, low, a place with low humidity, like where I practice in California, this is a desert environment. We don't have much humidity in the air. So eczema is uh, much worse um, in this area as compared to places that might be more humid, like Hawaii, for example. Hawaii, you had to bring that up, huh? <laughs> I also, I too live in a humid climate and it is also an H spot, but it's Houston, not Hawaii. <laughs> so another thing I wanted to bring up is you mentioned genetic factors. And so of course it does run in families, but another pattern that I've noticed is this triad of other similar, um, similar pathway, I guess, conditions. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about asthma and allergies or allergic rhinitis. So a lot of times when patients come in and they have a history of asthma and uh, allergies or allergic rhinitis or hay fever, whatever you want to call it, I am very I have a high index of suspicion for eczema as well. And so that's another a, a clue for patients who might have itchy skin and have that kind of a background. Yes, that's a great point. Um, we call it the atopic triad. Triad meaning three things that often go together. So um, if you have either eczema, atopic dermatitis, um, asthma, or seasonal allergies, you know, just having one of those things makes your increased likelihood of having the other two things as well. Okay. And many people do have all three at the same time. Yes, lucky, lucky them. So as far as other things that can make someone more prone to the possibility of having eczema, are there specific backgrounds or ethnicities that you've noticed that eczema tends to be more, um, more common in? Um, I would say that it affects everybody. Um, the, the prevalence is very high, as you mentioned in your introduction, that it can affect up to 10 to 20% of the population. So about one in five to one in 10 people during their lifetime will experience some form of eczema. Um, and it seems to affect you know all genders, men and women, um, all ages, although it does affect um, children more than adults and all ethnicities. Um, and the general trend is that we do see it happening more commonly in developed countries for whatever reason. Um, you know, the reason for this is not quite clear. Um, there is, you know, some different hypotheses about, you know, um, you know, being in a place that's much more cleaner and um, maybe that causes the immune system to not have as many exposures to different things and it, it starts to overactivate and react abnormally. But again, we don't really know the reason, although we do see it more in kind of developed countries like the United States. 
That's an interesting observation. As far as something you mentioned previously, which is that up to 20% of the population may experience it at some time or some form or another. That another question that I get very often from my patients is in children's part, in children particularly, if they have eczema or pretty severe eczema as children, their parents want to know, is this something they're going to have to suffer with for the rest of their lives? Is it something they're going to outgrow? Mm -hmm. And conversely, adults who've never had eczema, who suddenly develop it later in life, um, are wondering where did this come from? They've never had, they've never had that before. So I want to talk about that kind of um, pattern or maybe lack of pattern in patients, you know, do they outgrow their eczema? And then is it very difficult to kind of see it later in life if they never had it prior? Mm -hmm. So um, as I said before, you know, eczema is much more common during childhood. Um, occasionally you can have a new onset of eczema as an adult. Um, if they have a strong family history of eczema or they might've had, you know, as a kid, uh, this history of quote unquote sensitive skin, but it didn't really become more you know, full blown until they were older. Um, and for some children, as they get older, it is possible that the eczema might get better, but for many people, it may continue into adulthood as well. Um, in general, I like to tell patients that eczema is considered a chronic condition. So like many other diseases like diabetes or high blood pressure, um, you know, it's not something that we have a, a permanent cure for at this point. Um, it is something that is long lasting, usually many years. Um, it comes and goes, so sometimes it will get better, sometimes it will get worse. Um, and you know, our treatments are um, aimed at controlling the symptoms to help people feel less itchy and less comfortable in their skin. But in general, it is something that they're probably gonna have to deal with um, for the majority of their life. Understood. And so definitely later in this program, we're gonna talk about some of those methods or treatments and or management that we can offer for patients who are suffering with this. Now, another question that I get very often and I um, have to spend a little bit of time educating are for patients who might have just dry skin as opposed to eczema. And so it's it can pose as a challenge for patients, especially when it comes to treatment, because if you have dry skin, it's going to be itchy, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's just the nature of that. And then they think that, well, then this must be eczema because we did describe it as itchy skin, mm -hmm. dry skin in the beginning of this episode. So what distinguishes eczema from just dry skin? Help us out with that. So, you know, everybody has dry skin um, where I live because, you know, <laughs> as I said, we live in a desert environment here in California. So, um, so dry skin can also feel itchy, as you mentioned, but usually with um, aggressive moisturization using a moisturizing cream or lotion multiple times a day and after bathing, um, it helps once the skin is hydrated, it improves. Eczema is a little bit different because of that impaired barrier function of the skin. So the skin is not only dry, but it also has inflammation. And so when the skin is inflamed, it um, it feels dry, it feels itchy, and it will look red, and it will look scaly and flaky. Okay, so redness, flaking the skin, and itching are all signs of active inflammation in the skin. And although moisturizing um, the skin um, would help, it's usually not sufficient to calm down the signif significant amount of inflammation that's going on. For that, you really need um, prescription ointments from your doctor. So to recap, it's, it's more serious than just regular dry skin, and it takes more than just over-the-counter moisturizers and lotions to help reduce the symptoms. And then there is this added layer of inflammation that just differentiates it from dry skin. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that we've done a really good job of just laying the groundwork for what eczema is in this first section of this uh, episode today. We're going to take a quick break here and we'll be back in a few minutes and we'll talk some more about this. You're watching What's Up Doc. I'm your host, Dr. Ali El Barwani, and we'll be back after this short break. A free online chat can give you the personalized tips you need to start boosting your retirement savings today. 
our fellow Americans. Right now, the COVID-19 vaccines are available to millions of Americans. And soon, they will be available to everyone. The science is clear. These vaccines will protect you and those you love from this dangerous and deadly disease. They could save your life. So we urge you to get vaccinated when it's available to you. That's the first step to ending the pandemic and moving our country forward. It's up to you. Bedroom. Come on, come on. Okay, Dad. One, two, three. Ah! Dad! You saved me. Dad? Are you okay? I'm fine, dear. Your hero needs you now, and AARP is here to help. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org caregiving. We are justice for all. Headquartered in the heart of downtown Chicago, Justice for All is a global humanitarian initiative dedicated to raising awareness for human rights concerns impacting vulnerable minority groups. Our diverse team of staff and volunteers, led by Imam Malik Mujahid, work tirelessly to help Justice for All achieve their goals. We promote policies that protect religious freedom, address the root causes of mass displacement, and recognize the plight of refugees and forced migrants. Together, we can continue to stand up for justice. Justice for all. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. When times get dark, we can't see the help that's all around us. Let 211 be your guiding light for help with food, health care, and other resources. 211, how can I help you? Call 211 or visit 211.org. 211, get connected, get help. Something more than a birthday is happening here. Once you can see it, you can help. The sooner you recognize the signs of autism, the sooner you can make a lifetime of difference for your child. Start by answering a few simple questions at screenforautism.org. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to What's Up Doc. I'm your host, Dr. Alia Barwani, and today we're talking about eczema. Joining us in that discussion is Dr. Gloria Nguyen. Before the break, Dr. Nguyen, we were talking about defining eczema and um, talking a little bit about what are the symptoms and what are the things that can make you possibly more prone or can um, be something that can be, be a contributor possibly even to atopic dermatitis or eczema. Now, I want us to talk a little bit about what what does the diagnosis or how, what, how when a patient comes into your office, what are the things that you do in order to make that diagnosis? Um, of course, as a dermatologist, you see this very often. In primary care, we see this as well. We don't have nearly as many specialized tools or need to do nearly as much in our office setting. 
but possibly in yours, it may look a little bit different. So why don't you share with us if a patient comes in with itchy skin, what are the things that you usually do to make a diagnosis? Right. So, um, you know, eczema is predominantly clinical diagnosis, meaning that we look at the skin um, and we make the diagnosis based on what the skin looks like. Um, but getting a history is important as well. Um, is there a family history of eczema? Um, oftentimes mom will have eczema or dad will have eczema or brothers and sisters. Um, is there a you know history of having had um, sensitive skin um, as a kid? Um, and so, you know, eczema doesn't usually just all of a sudden pop up overnight. There's usually a longstanding history of having, you know, itchy, rashy um, things happening during childhood. Um, so that usually um, will paint a nice picture um, of uh, what the diagnosis is. Um, and then, um, you know, people who have had longstanding eczema, they will, because it feels so itchy, they'll often um, be scratching their skin a lot. And um, when the skin is chronically scratched, it can develop what we call lichenification, which is where the skin can become thickened over time and also become darker over time. So, um, you know, sometimes, for example, the back of the neck, when you look at the back of the neck, it, the skin there will look thicker and a little bit darker because the person has been scratching their skin for a long time, usually for many years. Um, in children, um, they can get what are called atopic shiners, which are basically, you know, the skin around their eyes looks a little bit more shiny um, because they're always kind of rubbing their eyes because they're itchy. Um, and then you can also ask about a history of asthma or seasonal allergies as well. Um, and if they're positive, then um, what you're seeing is more likely to be eczema, because as I said, in the atopic triad, these three things tend to go together. Excellent. And so when there is confusion or doubt, you said you described a very classic case, but when there is not a classic case, do you treat and see if they get better? Are you doing a biopsy? Is is there anything more that you're doing to kind of confirm a diagnosis for um, treatment? Yeah, so, um, you know, if you are treating it as if it is eczema, as in you're using topical steroid creams and you're moisturizing and it's not responding, it's not improving, um, that should um, trigger some suspicion that something else might be going on. Um, I've, because this, the rash can look a little bit nonspecific, if you're seeing it for the first time, a new onset rash in an adult who has never had any prior history of skin problems as a child, and they suddenly develop the severe rash um, as an adult, and they have no family history of eczema, um, and you treat them with topical steroids, um, and they're not responding, then in those cases, I will do a biopsy just to rule out um, more rare uh, forms of um, inflammatory skin conditions that can mimic eczema. And walk us through for our audience, for a lot of people, when they hear the word biopsy, they interpret it as you are cutting out a piece of something. And it can be very nerve wracking or frightening for a lot of our patients. Can you go through what you do to get a biopsy in this situation? Um, because that may be holding people back from coming in because they think that that's what's going to happen. Um, but I think reassuring them and explaining to them how safe and um, effective biopsies are might be helpful. Yeah. Well, I will just mention that in the vast majority of cases of eczema, I do not need to do I do not need to perform a skin biopsy. So I would say this is not the typical case at all. Um, but a biopsy means just taking a sample of tissue, <coughs> technically sample, um, any organ, right? For skin biopsy, we're taking a sample of the skin. So we would basically pick an area of skin that is um, affected, meaning an area that looks red and inflamed. And um, uh, most of the time what we do is we give some uh, local numbing medicine to the area with lidocaine. And then we take a little plug of skin, um, about four millimeters of the size of a pencil eraser, so very small. Um, and, you know, after the numbing medicine, the person really does not feel anything. Um, and then after we take the little plug of skin, we put in one or two stitches, um, and then it eventually will heal with a very small scar. Um, and then that plug of skin is sent to the lab for more testing. And the pathologist will look at it under the microscope and they will look for any abnormality that is deeper in the skin, whether it be inflammation that is consistent with eczema 
or um, anything else that might be abnormal. Excellent. So I think the key there to allay people's fears is that you use a numbing medicine. So this isn't something that you're just kind of going for. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Dr. Nguyen. Next, I want to just talk about what you mentioned earlier with that um, itch scratch cycle, right? Where you said you have lichenification or thickening of the skin that can occur, particularly in the back of the neck and back of the neck and other areas that come as a result of the dry, itchy skin it's natural for us to want to go ahead and, and scratch that area, but then it leads to this cycle of, you know, it's, it's, you, it, you scratch it and sometimes that can feel good, but then it can also make you feel even more itchy and you're going to want to scratch even more. And let's talk about what that leads to, as you mentioned earlier, but also some of the complications that can arise as a result of that chronic scratching and that lichenification that you mentioned. Right. So, you know, this chronic itch scratch cycle is a problem for many people who live with eczema. Um, you know, the skin is the skin feels itchy, so the person scratches the skin. But um, by scratching the skin, they're actually causing um, the cells in their skin to release chemicals that cause um, more local inflammation um, in the skin. And as a result of that inflammation, um, it causes more itching and then they scratch some more. So you can see how it easily becomes a chronic itch scratch cycle. Um, and we work a lot on trying to break that um, cycle, um, especially for kids. They can get, develop the habit of just all, always just scratching their, their skin, even when their eczema is not very flared up, just because they, it becomes a habit over time. Um, and some of the complications that can develop, well, if you're scratching your skin really hard, you're scratching your skin open, it can break open the skin and cause a secondary bacterial infection. So people with eczema that is more severe are at higher risk of developing staph bacteria infections, um, which presents as honey colored crusting on the skin or maybe yellow oozing. And in those cases, we often do have to prescribe um, either topical or and, and or oral antibiotics to help treat the infection. Um, patients can also develop other secondary infections such as viral infections. So there's a condition called eczema herpeticum where young children with severe atopic dermatitis develop a secondary infection with herpes virus. Um, and they're often quite sick um, and need to be hospitalized to receive IV um, antiviral medication. Um, and then there's also, you know, the social impact of living with eczema. So as I said, many children um, suffer from atopic dermatitis. And um, because of this, you know, uncomfortable, itchy sensation in their skin that happens, you know, almost all the time, you know, it impairs their ability to sleep at night. They're not getting very good sleep. It impairs their ability to pay attention um, during school. Um, they have found that uh, patients, kids with eczema have a higher likelihood to also have a diagnosis of ADHD or attention deficit um, because it makes it harder for them to focus and pay attention. Um, and so it's really important to assess how much the disease is impacting their quality of life um, because uh, it can have, you know, especially in children, it can have um, implications um, for years down the road. Very interesting. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Nguyen. So it sounds like it's a very important condition. It's not just some itchy skin. It sounds like there are longer term implications, um, especially in children, as you mentioned, and then implications for possible infection. I actually had a patient come in um, a few weeks ago and when she came in, it did not at all look like a classic eczema. She actually looked like she had a cellulitis. And on top of that, she had that lichenification, that um, thickening of the skin, as you mentioned, that can occur with chronic scratching and it, it looked very very ugly and i think that if she had come in earlier um we could it could have been a smaller problem than it ended up being so really important that if you are having symptoms that you do go into your doctor and and, and talk about some treatment i completely agree now 
we talked about triggers a little bit earlier. And before we jump into treatment, I want to also mention some things that we can do before treatment is, is to prevent these flare-ups like we had mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. One of the things that can trigger a flare-up is changing the climate or the, the even the humidity in an environment. But in some of my patients, especially those that have that triad um, atopic triad with asthma and allergies along with the eczema, they tend to have a more allergic, I guess, or hypersensitivity to foods, for example. So dairy might be a trigger for their eczema. And that when they have that, it can worsen some of the other symptoms, their allergies, as well as their asthma. Let's talk a little bit about that. If you've noticed that with patients or if you counsel patients on triggers such as food or other triggers than just the environment. Yeah, definitely. So people who have eczema um, are also at likely have a higher risk of having environmental allergies and also have a higher risk of food allergies. Um, and sometimes these can be diagnosed even um, when they're younger. So if there is a suspicion that um, there's certain things um, outdoors, um, exposure to weeds, pollens, grasses that may be uh, making the skin worse or eating certain foods seems to trigger, um, you know, worse, uh, worse symptoms. It may be worthwhile to see an allergist to do um, either food allergy testing or environmental testing. Um, that can be helpful. Um, and um, as you mentioned, I mean, there are different triggers for eczema. The main trigger is dry skin. The more the dry the skin is, the more it brings out the eczema. So whatever you can do to keep the skin hydrated um, is going to be helpful, whether it be moisturizing the skin, you know, three, four, five, six times a day if needed. Um, the best time to moisturize is right after a shower, because after bathing or shower, you're washing away the natural moisturizers in the skin. So you have to immediately add back that the, the moisturizer. Um, I usually tell patients to kind of pat their skin dry so that they're after a shower, so they're not dripping wet, but their skin is still a little bit moist. And that's the best time to apply thick moisturizing, um, unscented moisturizer like Cetaphil cream or CeraVe cream, for example. Um, and then, um, as you mentioned, there are the environmental triggers. Um, a common one, and these can come in, you know, the form of everyday household items like dishwasher soap, hand soap. Um, many of the skin products that we use, shampoos, um, laundry detergents, lotions, um, especially the ones that contain fragrance. Um, those are a big problem because uh, fragrances are a major cause of allergic skin reactions, especially with people with underlying eczema. So I always tell people, make sure that everything that touches your skin, whether it be soaps, lotions, laundry detergents, anything else, it must be fragrance-free, unscented, and hypoallergenic. I, you know, you really want to avoid um, all the stuff at like Bath and Body Works because all of those products have smells, right? And those perfumes and smells can make the skin worse over time. Um, and then another trigger that uh, is probably underappreciated is stress. So, um, you know, for many people, when they're stressed out, their eczema tends to flare. Um, you know, we don't know ex the exact mechanism by which that happens. You know, stress makes a lot of different health conditions worse. Um, and this and eczema is no exception. I love that you mentioned that. Absolutely, stress is it. We underestimate how how much of an effect stress has on so much in our health uh, and in our life in general. But thank you for that. It was very thorough. And I similarly counsel my patients on they don't think about things that we use every day, just like you mentioned, like laundry detergent, you know, um, patients who have eczema have come in and I'll, I'll ask the history from them, you know, what's changed. And then they'll be like, you know what, my wife or my mom or I, you know, went and bought something that was on sale and now they're coming in with this flare up of their eczema. So that's a really good point. I'm sure that that will benefit a lot of our audience. Thank you. It could also be that they have recently traveled and they stayed at an Airbnb or a hotel. Yes. They, didn't bring their own, they didn't bring their own products, so they're using the hotel's products, which yeah. always have a very strong, strong smell, which means it has perfume or fragrance in it. So that can often trigger things as well. 
Exactly. I like that. Um, so we do have to take a quick little break here, Dr. Nguyen. And when we come back, we'll talk some more about this and talk about some treatment options for our audience. Thank you for watching. Um, please stay tuned and come back. We'll be gone for a short break here. You're watching What's Up Doc on Muslim Network TV. A free three-minute online chat can give you the personalized tips you need to start boosting your retirement savings today. When times get dark, we can't see the help that's all around us. Let 211 be your guiding light for help with food, health care, and other resources. 211, how can I help you? Call 211 or visit 211.org. 211. Get connected, get help. Dad, they took over my bedroom. Come on, come on. Okay, Dad. One, two, three. Find her. Your hero needs you now, and AARP is here to help. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org slash caregiving. We are justice for all. Headquartered in the heart of downtown Chicago, Justice for All is a global humanitarian initiative dedicated to raising awareness for human rights concerns impacting vulnerable minority groups. Our diverse team of staff and volunteers, led by Imam Malik Mujahid, work tirelessly to help Justice for All achieve their goals. We promote policies that protect religious freedom, address the root causes of mass displacement, and recognize the plight of refugees and forced migrants. Together, we can continue to stand up for justice. Justice for all. I am what hunger looks like in America. I am an eight-year-old girl who's not excited for the last day of school because this may be the last time I'll have lunch. Till September. I am a single father of two who works three part-time jobs, and that's still not enough to put food on the table. I was created by artificial intelligence from faces of the one in eight Americans who struggle with hunger. Feeding America, 200 food banks strong. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. Assalamualaikum and welcome back to What's Up Doc. I'm your host, Dr. Adi El Barwani, and today we've been talking about eczema with our host, with our guest, excuse me, Dr. Gloria Nguyen. Before the break, Dr. Nguyen and I, we were talking about basically what are some triggers for eczema. We talked about some really common things in our household, such as detergents, soaps, um, even new sheets at a hotel can trigger eczema flares. I want us to talk next about treatment options for eczema. As we both know, the treatment can vary from something that's very mild. Um, the dose that we use may be very small, and it can be um, it can go up depending on the severity of symptoms. So, when a, a patient comes in to see 
a provider or you in the office, what should they expect to maybe walk away with if they do in fact have eczema? So, uh, you know, a lot of eczema is about um, patient education um, and counseling about lifestyle changes. So, you know, we talk about, you know, the list of products that they're using on their skin. We have them throw away anything that has perfume or fragrance and replace it with something that's unscented and hypoallergenic. Um, and then we talk a lot about the importance of moisturizing. Um, so, um, you know, if you think, thinking going back to your skin as a leaky barrier, that um, leaky brick wall, you know, you need a moist, thick moisturizer to help seal up the leaks in that wall. So um, the thicker the moisturizer, um, the better. So for example, a cream that you would scoop out of like a jar or a jug in general is gonna be better than a pump in, in a lotion, uh, pump lotion bottle, which is um, thinner and tends to evaporate more easily off the, off the skin. And then for really stubborn areas, even something greasy like Vaseline, petroleum jelly, or Aquaphor is really good. Um, for example, people who have uh, really bad eczema on their hands from frequent hand washing um, should apply thick moisturizer after each hand wash. Um, and after, so those things are kind of, you know, that's a lifestyle habit. You know, as I said, you will have eczema for the majority of your life. And so you have to get into the habit of moisturizing frequently. Um, and then the other part of it is um, going to see your doctor um, who can prescribe you um, cortisone um, creams and ointments that help calm down that inflammation um, in the skin. Because as we had discussed, eczema is not just dry skin, it's dry skin with inflammation in the skin. And so you still need something to calm down that inflammation. And a topical steroid cream is going to be the best way to do that. Um, there's many different strengths of topical steroid creams. There are some that are lower strength that are safe to use on areas of the body where the skin is thinner, like the face and skin folds. And then there are stronger topical steroids that can be prescribed for other parts of the area where thin skin is as not as much of an issue. Um, and I usually have patients apply these cortisone ointments when their eczema is flaring twice a day for two weeks continuously to really knock down that inflammation um, and then take and then take a break off for one or two weeks to allow the skin to recover and then repeat as needed for flares. Um, a lot of people are concerned about the side effect of uh, skin thinning that is caused by topical steroids. This really only happens when you use steroids incorrectly um, or inappropriately, meaning you're using it continuously um, every day for months and months without taking a break. But as long as you're taking a break after about two weeks of continuous use and then resuming, um, it's considered very safe and effective to do so. Um, other lifestyle things that can be helpful would be, for example, um, trying to not bathe more than once a day if, if necessary. Um, the more you bathe, the more dry your skin gets and that can make the eczema worse. Um, and then during baths or showers, I tell people not to use very hot water. Hot water dries out the skin more. Use as lukewarm water as you can tolerate. So if you're getting out of the shower and your bathroom mirror is completely fogged up, then the water is probably too hot. Um, and then um, as we mentioned, you know, people with eczema have a high risk of skin infection. Um, because they're often scratching their skin open, which can cause an infection. And studies also show that patients with eczema have a um, higher number, number of bacteria living on their skin at baseline. And these bacteria not only increase risk of infection, they actually secrete um, signals that promote inflammation in the skin, and that can also make the eczema worse as well. So I sometimes have my patients do a dilute, dilute bleach bath at home. So if you have access to a bathtub, um, you fill the bathtub with water and then you put in one third cup of household bleach or Clorox and then soak your body in it from the neck down for about 10 to 15 minutes and then rinse your body off with regular water, um, soap and water and do that about you know once every other week. And, and that does help reduce the amount of bacteria that lives on the skin which can reduce the risk of infection and also improve, decrease the severity of the eczema as well. Um, sorry. 
I was just going to say, I, I also encourage those bleach baths. They're really helpful for a lot of patients. Um, along those lines, just before you move on, I'm sorry to interrupt, but how do you feel about oatmeal baths? Um, I think oatmeal baths are fine. Um, you know, oatmeal is a moisturizing factor, so it does help with skin hydration. Um, it is very rare, but possible for some people to have an allergy to oat. So if you have had testing done and you test positive to oat, then obviously that would be something to avoid. But for most people, it should be fine. Okay, great. And and I'm sorry, I hope I didn't break up your train of thought there with your answer. I saw let you not at all. <laughs> So, um, I, you know, we talked about um, treatment for mild eczema. For people with more um, severe eczema whose um, itching and skin inflammation is not sufficiently controlled with moisturizer and topical steroid creams, um, the next thing to consider could be, for example, phototherapy. Um, this is something that you could discuss with, uh, with your dermatologist. Um, phototherapy is uh, light therapy. Um, you can think of it as a tanning bed, but it's much safer because it filters out all the wavelengths of light that are harmful to the skin that cause skin cancer. And it retains just a very specific narrow band of wave light called narrow band, UV, uh, narrow band UVB light. And um, people usually do it three times a week. Um, it can be done at home even um, for a few minutes each session. And this light therapy can also help to control the inflammation that's in the skin. Um, and then for patients who um, are not able to be controlled with either topical steroids or phototherapy, that's when we usually start to think about um, stronger um, systemic treatments, meaning um, either oral pill medicines or injectable medicines that help control the eczema from the inside out and not just from the outside in. Um, these should be reserved for the most severe cases. Um, because they do uh, have more risks. Um, the main side effect of these systemic therapies is that they work by um, slightly lowering the immune system, um, which can increase your risk of infection. Um, but they do work very well to control symptoms in patients with very severe eczema. All right, so thank you, Dr. Nguyen. That was a very thorough explanation of the different treatment options that are available for different forms of eczema. I do wonder, though, about non-steroid topical treatments such as, and again, I have no affiliation, um, but you, Chris, I've seen ads for that on TV. I'm sure patients have and our audience have as well. Do you use that in your practice, and what are your thoughts on that? Um, we do use non-steroidal creams and ointments um, to give patients' skin a break from steroid ointments. Um, I, we often use um, tacrolimus or protopic and elodil or uh, pimecrolimus as a non-steroidal cream. So um, these are basically, they do something similar to the steroids. They basically calm down inflammation in the skin. Um, they may not be as strong as the steroid cream, um, but we do use it as um, an alternative to, to alternate with the steroid cream. Um, Eucrisa, the one that you mentioned, is a newer one that has just been introduced to the market over the last few years. Um, it is a little bit more expensive, so sometimes I have found that um, cost may be an issue with newer medications. Um, and then some patients report um, that when they apply Eucrisa, that it may cause some skin pain and skin burning sensation. So that's something that you do have to counsel people on. Um, and, you know, it, it works by a novel mechanism of action, which is why it's, you know, good to have different um, treatments that work in different ways to control eczema. But from a clinical practice standpoint, I don't think that the Eucrisa is any better than a non-steroidal um, uh, ointment like Protopic or Elidil. So I don't use it as often. Okay, good to know, thank you. And you shared with us a lot of non-medication things that patients can do as far as the baths are concerned. Um, something that I have noticed and I'm wondering about is with dry brushing. I don't know if you're familiar with that or if your patients have asked you, but I have some that do some dry brushing, which is where they take 
a boar bristle. It looks basically like a big hairbrush. And before taking a shower, they use it to help encourage circulation in the skin and also with lymphatic drainage. And it also happens to remove dead skin cells because it's just exfoli a mechanical kind of exfoliation. Mm -hmm. Would you ask that patients with eczema avoid dry brushing or will it help with their eczema if you're familiar with that? I am not as familiar with the, <clears throat> the, um, the method of dry brushing, but just from hearing your description of it, I would recommend that if a patient has eczema that they should try to avoid it. Um, you know, you don't want to do anything that is going to be too abrasive to the skin. Um, that tends to cause, you know, um, it can cause mechanical irritation. Um, and as I said, people with eczema have an impaired skin barrier. So they already have that leaky skin. And um, if you're, you know, traumatizing it, um, you know, it can make that worse. Um, the skin naturally exfoliates. You know, you are always shedding dead skin cells everywhere you go um, all the time. And there's new skin cells that are growing to replace it. So there's really no need to go in and mechanically exfoliate your skin. Your body naturally does that 24-7. Um, um, and I think that anything that where you're just scrubbing too hard on the skin can potentially cause more harm than good. Thank you for that, Dr. Nguyen. And thank you so much for spending so much time with us today and sharing with us in your knowledge. Uh, and thank you for bearing with me as my uh, cold, <laughs> I'm recovering from this cold today. Uh, I wish you every success in your career. Thank you so much for having me back on the show. It was my pleasure. And um, you know, you did a great job. I hope you feel better soon. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you for joining us in another episode of What's Up Doc. I hope you had a blessed and joyful Eid al-Adha. And you can watch all of our other shows on our website at muslimnetwork.tv. I'm your host, Dr. Ali Al-Barwani, and I'll see you next time on another episode of What's Up Doc.